AJ Walkers, happy Sunday. We're in Mark chapter 14, and we're looking at something really cool leading up to Easter right now. It is Jesus praying in Gethsemane, and I'm calling this message, When Tribulation Comes, Pressed But Not Broken. The reason is because we see an example of what we're supposed to do in times of tribulation and what Jesus does in the Garden of Gethsemane, because he's about to go through it. This is probably one of the most stressful most difficult times of his entire life. And this is how he handles it. And this is what God does in return. So starting in verse 32 of chapter 14 of the book of Mark, it says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We're going to pause there. We're going to go a little further, but we're going to stop there for now. So I want us to see some things. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. That word Gethsemane, it's first of all, it's a garden. And the garden is an olive garden, but it's also a place that means the name of Gethsemane means olive press. And so this is the place that they would go and they would squeeze, crush olives to get the oil out of them to make olive oil that they would use for cooking. They would use for lots of different things, burning to make fire. Like there were lots of uses for this olive oil, but the olives had to be crushed and pressed to get to the value of them. And if you haven't already seen what's coming, Jesus is about to be crushed and pressed, just like these olives. And so him doing this in this place already has significant meaning. And then it says, he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So he wants them to, you know, he's going to, he's going to go kind of be alone with God. Important. So important. That we have to be alone with God sometimes. That should be a daily thing. That should be our go-to thing. But then he says, And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. So Jesus had this kind of inner circle. So he had his 12 disciples. Now they're really down to 11. And within that, he had three. Peter, James, and John that got to see some special things. They were with him on the mount when he was transfigured. They got to go into the room and see the woman raised from the dead. They've seen some things that the others haven't. They're kind of his his inner circle. So there's this, it talks about like concentric circles of Jesus. And at the center of this is him and God. And then we've got Peter, James, and John. And then we've got the rest of the disciples. And then we've got the, the followers outside of that. And then we've got the crowd and the masses. And then we've got the nation of Israel. And then we've got the world. So we've got these concentric circles. And this is, we're really seeing already the two innermost circles. Jesus going to pray, talking to God. And now Jesus bringing those three guys, his three top guys with him to kind of stand with him. He needs them right now more than ever because he's about to be pressed. He's about to be crushed. And his boys should be able to be there. So do you have a three? Like three people that you would go to that you'd be like, hey, I'm about to go through it. I need you guys to go through it with me. Maybe it's family members. Maybe it's close friends. Maybe you're still working on getting those three people that you can really trust. That's something that Jesus had. And that's something that he worked really hard to establish. So that's just a little side thing, but it's a pretty neat one, I think. But still, he was greatly distressed and troubled. So we had a little talk a few weeks ago, me and my discipleship group. And one of the questions that we asked about this moment exactly was, did Jesus lose his peace? Like we see in the life of Jesus all the time, lots of stuff's going crazy. Like the storm's happening, he's sleeping in the boat. Like everybody else is freaking out. He's like, calm down. But this moment, we see Jesus and it looks like he's the one that's kind of losing it a little bit. Like he's flustered, right? Jesus is shook right now. And so it begs a couple questions like, like, why is that happening? Why is he feeling that way? Did he lose that peace that he's always been so like gripping onto that he's always had? What's happening? So I personally do not think that Jesus lost his peace. I think that it was definitely being tested 
it was it was like being pressed, being crushed, and this tribulation was coming upon him and he knew what was happening. But why was Jesus so distressed and troubled? I think that it's actually more about what he knew was coming. So so Jesus was not just an ordinary, like, unknowing sacrifice. You have a lamb, and it doesn't know that it's about to be killed. It doesn't know that it's about to be slaughtered. It's trusting all the way up until the end, right? And it, until its neck is cut or broken, it doesn't even know that that's what's about to happen. Jesus knows. He knows what's coming. He knows that he's about to be sacrificed, crushed. And I think that what this is, is Jesus feeling the weight of the sins of the world. It wasn't that he feared death. It wasn't that he feared going to the cross. It was more that he dreaded the awfulness knowing that the sin of the world was going to be placed on him. There's a Bible verse that says he became sin. Like, so that's what Jesus is going through. He's fearing, not fearing because that's the right, not the right word. He's not fearful but he's stressing about he's what what does it say distressed and troubled by the fact that he is about to feel the full wrath of god on himself the the righteous justice of god that is to be served to sinners is about to be served to him he's going to feel the full weight of that sin he's going to feel the full wrath of god on himself and that's stress like, that's troubling. That's what Jesus is getting all worked up about. But this is what it says. Uh, he says, and my, he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. So he's like, I feel this heaviness. This, it feels like I'm going to die. It feels so heavy on me right now. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And, and he said, Abba, Father, all, all things are possible for you. In other words, he's like, God, if, if you wanted to anything, you could do anything. Can you take this away? Can I not have to feel the wrath of sin? Can I not have to take on this, this weight that's going to be so heavy? that it's going to crush me. It says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. That line right there is what I want to pray. It's the way that I want to live my life. Yet not what I will, but what you will. See, Jesus resolved that day that he was going to willingly lay his life down. Now, I know that he had already resolved it. He already knew. That's why he came. That's what he's been preparing for this whole time. But the weight hit him on this day, and he willingly said, I'm going to do this. Not what I want, God. Not what I think is best. Not what I would choose for myself. But what you want, what you would choose, what you would have me do. I trust you more than I trust myself. And that's Jesus I don't know, it's weird because it's like he is God, but he is submitting to the Father, even though he and the Father are equal. He and the Father are one. It's a beautiful, amazing thing. It's a picture in marriage. It's a picture in relationships. It's a picture in a lot of different things, but it is a picture right here of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We'll see that too. And then it says, um, the verse that... I think of that actually brought us to this verse in my discipleship group was John 16, 33. It was actually our memory verse for the week. It says, I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. This is Jesus speaking. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So what Jesus is saying and what he's doing right now is he's overcoming the world right now. And he's about to overcome the world and the cross. And he's overcome sin and he's overcome death. And those things hadn't happened quite yet, but that's what's, that's what's happening. That's what he's in the process of doing. And he says, those things, what I've done, how I've lived, what I've accomplished, that's what will bring you peace. And so Jesus in this moment, you know, he hasn't done these things yet. He's doing them. And so where does his peace come from? Well, he gets it straight from God. It says here, um, not what I will, but what you will. So that's the verse. I think that what 
this verse shows me and and it shows a couple things. But one thing that it shows is that it's okay to pray to God to remove things from your life. Right? Like like Jesus he prayed that. He asked God, "Will you take this cup of suffering away from me?" Now we know from the Old Testament that a cup represented like the wrath of God. So when it says like drink this cup, it was a cup of wrath. So that's how I know that that's what Jesus is actually not excited about, right? That's the part that he's like, I really don't want to drink the cup of your wrath, God. Is there like another way for this to happen? If there is, if there is, I know that you'll do it. There's not. This is the one plan. This has always been the one plan. This has been the plan from Genesis. That God was going to sacrifice his son. He said, it's going to strike death's head and it'll strike his heel. That's speaking it in terms of the, the enemy, the devil, you know, but also it's a prophecy about what's coming. Jesus, from the beginning, is the way to overcome the sin of man. And so there is no other way. This is the way. This is the plan. Jesus later on would say, I don't. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe he already said it. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's later on in the Bible. It's in the book of John. 14, 6. Right? But this is what's happening. Jesus is the only way. Sometimes when God has us go through something, it might not be the only way, but it might be the best way. And we might not see it. We might not understand it. But if God wills it, we submit to that. We trust him in that. The reason why I wrote this down, I'm going to read it. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath at Calvary, but he decided to drink it at Gethsemane. Let that sink in. He drank the cup of God's wrath at Calvary, but he said on this day, not what I will, but what you will. He decided then that this is what he was going to do. We must decide now what we will do when difficulty comes. You have to pick that beforehand. If we don't decide now, you'll fail then. We have to make a decision now. What are we going to do when we're persecuted? What are we going to do when things get difficult? What are we going to do when we feel like taking the easy way out? Are we going to resolve to, to do what God wills and not what we will now? So that when it comes, we've already made that decision. Or are we going to try to hope that we make the right decision then? Because I'll tell you what, there's a warning about your ability to make that decision. And it's coming up right now. Let's keep going. It says, and he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So I, I said this was a warning, and I think it is, because it shows you people, right? These are the people. These are his one, two, and three guys right here. And they're asleep. One, two, and three times. They went to sleep three different times. He, he, he told them he needed them. This was the moment that he needed them more than anything. And they failed him over and over and over again. And that's what we do. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Verse 38, it says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We have a part to play, and so does God. It's not enough only to watch, nor is it enough only to pray. We must respond to the Spirit's leading and prompting to avoid certain tempting situations. We, must, we might have good intentions, but we're weak on our own. See, the reason I said that is because I think that's a good little reminder of what we can do in these times. See, we see what Jesus did. Jesus was awake. He was alert. He was tired, just like everybody else, but he stayed awake and he stayed alert. And he went to God. 
He went to God. So he was awake. He didn't go to sleep. A lot of times when they say like someone went to sleep, what they're talking about is like they stopped paying attention to what the word of God says, to what the Bible says. And they started listening to what the culture is saying. Like, wake up is what the Bible would say to that. Stop sleeping. Stop pretending like you don't know what I've said. Like I haven't said it. There's a lot of things going on in this world today that Christians are asleep on. We're acting like the word of God doesn't say it. Well, it says it. Stop sleeping. Wake up and pray. Wake up and pray for those things. Don't ignore them. Don't ignore the cause of the weak, the widow, of the child, of the unborn. Don't ignore their causes. Don't sleep and pretend like you don't see it. There's injustice happening. Wake up, watch, and pray. That's what Jesus would have us do. And in this situation, that's what he asked them to do. But they couldn't do it. They were too weak. They couldn't handle it. They were terrible. They're people. Your inner three are going to let you down. I asked you to name those three earlier. They're going to let you down. I'm sorry. They're people. You know who's not going to let you down? Spoiler alert. It's God. Um, Jesus' response to tribulation was prayer. God's response to Jesus isn't recorded in Mark chapter 14, as well as it's recorded in Luke chapter 22. So let's go there. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 22. I'm going to start in verse 42. You'll recognize the first part. By the way, when we, when we read in a different gospel, we're reading a parallel text, meaning it's the same story, but just told from a different perspective, from a different author, from different sources of information. So combined, they tell the full story. You can't just read in Mark, just read in Luke, just read in Matthew, just read in John. When you combine all four of those, you get the picture that God wants us to get. So this piece right here in Luke chapter 22 makes this story a little bit more clear. And it says, starting in verse 42, Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Sound familiar? Then it says this. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. <sighs> like, did you catch it? Did you see it? It says... Whenever Jesus prayed, when he asked God, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours, an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. That's what God does. See, the people that Jesus brought with him, his top three fell asleep. What did God do? He showed up with an angel and he strengthened Jesus. What did God do? He came and he was beside him in that moment of agony and, and distress and pain. And, and what did Jesus do? It strengthened him to pray more earnestly. So in tribulation, Jesus didn't start worrying about the tribulation. He didn't start letting it overpower him. There's a verse that talks about how we're pressed but not crushed. This is Jesus in the olive press in the thing that is supposed to crush the olives and squeeze all of the oil out. He's in that garden. He's in that place. And what's happening is as he's getting crushed, God comes and strengthens him so that he doesn't get destroyed. And that same thing can happen to us. We watch, stay awake, pray. God will show up and he will strengthen us. He won't let you down. You know how I know that? Because I know what Jesus does next. What Jesus does next is he, he gets arrested. He gets taken in front of the council. He gets brought in front of Pilate. They end up deciding that they're going to crucify him. And he could have stopped it at any moment. But he didn't for us. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what the joy before Jesus was? You being made right with God. Me being made right with God. The wall, the barrier between us and God, the wrath that was reserved for our disobedience, 
He took it on himself so that we could be made right with God, so that we could have a relationship with God, so that God's spirit could come and fill us. That's what Jesus did it for. He did it to strengthen us. Just like the angel came to strengthen him. Jesus endured all of this. He was crushed for us. But he was not broken. Pressed but not broken. When tribulation comes, he dealt with it just like we do. But it didn't destroy him. Didn't even break one of his bones. Because he did what we should do. What we can do. We can go to God and he'll strengthen us. If you've never gotten to God in that way, let's, let's go to him right now. Let's ask him in prayer to keep us awake, to change our hearts, to make us new, to save us. It's a willingness to turn from sin and to turn to him. That's all it is. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are and what you've done. I see your example in the garden of what to do when tribulation comes. It's trust you, turn to you, look to you. People will let me down, but you will not. You will strengthen me. And God, I pray today that you would forgive me for the times that I've disobeyed you, that I've gone against you, the things that I deserve wrath for. I see that you took them on yourself, that you endured them even though you didn't want to, and that that was the only way to restore my relationship to God. Jesus, thank you for doing that. I did not deserve that. But I accept that gift of your life and death and resurrection because you rose from the dead. You were not defeated. You were not destroyed. You were not crushed. So God, I, I pray that you would make me new. That you would make me like you, like Jesus. I want to live a life like he lived. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I pray that you would change my heart, make me a new creation, and help me to live a life of righteousness and holiness that brings you glory. Not because I can do it in my own strength, because my spirit may be willing, but my flesh is weak, but because you send your spirit to lead me and guide me and direct me every day from now on. I want that. I need that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, welcome to the family of believers. If you just prayed that, we're off for another week of Tuesday nights, but starting next Tuesday, we'll be back on. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing you then at 6 p.m. In the meantime, you're, you're out there and you're letting people know and you're preparing the way for God to do an amazing thing in the next 10 weeks, like he's done already so many times. And uh, God, we just thank you for who you are. Have a great week, Jay Walkers. It's getting close to Easter. It's really cool that we're kind of in this section right now, but I can't wait to go a little bit deeper with you next time. Love you guys. Bye.